Hi, Clara. It's Stephanie and Adrian from the How to Be a Redhead podcast. We're so excited to have you on. Hi, thank you so much for having me. This is a, a fun opportunity. Yeah. So we always jump in and ask what it is like for our guests who are redheads. How was it for them growing up with red hair? And we do want to know how it is, but we feel like it's so connected to your inspirational all around story. So reading from a 2018 Instagram post, quote, 10 years ago, I broke my neck at gymnastics practice and was told I would never walk again. It was an unfathomable statement for anybody to hear, but as a 12-year-old, I couldn't quite understand the severity of my circumstances and refused to let it come true. After working through years of challenges and setbacks, I feel incredibly lucky to not only be back on my feet, but to be living a lifestyle that allows for me to take advantage of all that my body is capable of. Some days anyway. I'm thrilled to celebrate today with some time on skis and a long bike ride. A huge thanks to friends and family near and far who encouraged me throughout my recovery and who inspire me every day to get after it, end quote. So can you please share with our audience and our listeners the story of your strength with us? And then we want to focus on your beautiful life and how you're living it to this day. Sure. So I grew up uh, one of four kids and three out of the four of us have red hair. So it was actually That's really awesome. nice to have siblings. Yeah. Too. We could lean on each Where's other. Where's the gene come from? My dad is a redhead as well. And then Okay, same um, with Adrian and I. Yeah. Yeah, I think my mom's mom, she she colored her hair, so I'm not sure what her true color was, but she definitely was trying to be a redhead, so we'll say it came from her side too. Um so it was great. We were all very active kids and um grew up very competitive with each other, so my parents naturally put us in sports and I had a knack for gymnastics. I was definitely the bounciest, most energetic of the four of us. So I think they were just looking to get me to, to calm down. Have an outlet. Yeah. (laughs) To, to get your energy out. (laughs) So I was a competitive gymnast among other sports. I also was a downhill skier and track runner, but I most, I, I, I loved gymnastics the most, I would say. So I had kind of a fluke accident at practice at the age of 12, where I fell on my head and crushed two vertebrae in my neck and was fully paralyzed from the neck down. And it was kind of, we just never knew to what extent I would recover. And so I was very lucky to be walking within about a month of my injury and slowly regaining function throughout the rest of my body, arms and sensations and all of the, the rest of the the nerve recovery. So it was about a three year process of truly getting back to, um, kind of my new normal, but yeah, it was uh, quite, quite a traumatic event at at the age of 12. Wow. Wow. And I'm, I'm so blown away that you were able to just bounce back and be so positive. You know, I can just see you smiling and I'm sure it was a journey, but have, did you, or you, do you feel like you've become stronger from, from this situation or were you strong already? Did you have a, you know, you you seem like you have a great family and a great support system. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that's right. My family is incredibly supportive. Um, As a gymnast and just an athlete in general, I think I was very, goal oriented from a young age, and especially a sport like gymnastics, where there are different levels and you have to have different skills in order to progress. And so I was so used to just having that mentality and especially getting hurt frequently. I also had some smaller injuries throughout my childhood, broken foot, broken wrist, just from kind of getting after it a little too much, I guess. But It felt like just another obstacle. It really wasn't um, something insurmountable in my eyes. And like I said, my family was cheering me on and I had quite quite an amazing community back home in Maine that was just um, so, so caring, caring for both me and um, my siblings. So I just felt very lucky. Wow. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And on Instagram, you describe yourself as a walking quadriplegic. Please explain to our listeners what that term means. And Clara, just so you know, Stephanie and I are, are always asking these questions because we we ourselves don't know either, even though we did Google everything. So we always like to inform everyone who's listening. And as a follow-up, do you think of yourself as disabled? I'm going to say that you don't just from talking to you. Yeah, but. a little bit of both. So 
To answer the first question, um, a quadriplegic is somebody who has nerve impairment in all four limbs. So my injury level, when we talk about spinal cord injuries, uh, you talk about the vertebrae as the injury level. So that's the highest up that you have nerve impairment. So when I said I crushed two vertebrae, I crushed C5 and C6. So if you reach behind your neck and you feel that big bones, that's C7. So I broke the two just above that. And I have nerve damage from from that level down. Um, my left side is sensory impaired. So I've lost the ability to discern temperature. So I can't distinguish hot or cold and also sharp, dull. So I can feel pressure. I just don't have any sense of whether something is sharp or hot. And then on my right side, I have pretty normal sensation, but I have lost the motor function. So I have some muscle groups have returned, but not everything. And I'm able to walk around and I think present as able-bodied for the most part, unless somebody has some context with my backstory and they can look at my gait, which is the way that I walk and and see that my right leg just kind of drags a little bit more than my left. But I think both coming from an athletic background and just being lucky with the extent that I recovered, I've pretty well kind of passed as able-bodied. Um, and it's interesting because I didn't really think about disability much beyond my rehabilitation in Atlanta. So I, I spent several months there as an inpatient at this specialty hospital um, immediately post-injury just because Maine didn't really have the resources to to give the specialty mm. care that I needed. And at that center, everything was focused on how to get back to life as a wheelchair user and and how to assimilate and come to terms with the disability. And I was walking out of the place and really felt like I didn't belong to that group anymore, um, for better or worse. Of course, I acknowledge how fortunate I was, but I also just felt like I didn't really have a place. And adaptive mm-hmm. sports weren't really on my mind because I felt so able-bodied, like I had recovered so much. And I went to college in Washington State, so about as far away as possible from where <laughs> I grew up in Maine. And I didn't necessarily hide it from people, but I really didn't want to tell anybody. I didn't really want that to be your def- yeah, you like find you right. When you're meeting and, people for the first time, yeah, right. And in high school, middle school, and high school, like I went to a school with 190 kids in my graduating class, so. It was tiny and everybody knew me as a girl who broke her neck and I was in a wheelchair for several years. Um, I had an additional injury on top of the neck injury, um, which I won't go into, but it definitely was a longer process and very public. And I might, like I said, my community really um, helped take care of my siblings while my parents and I were in Atlanta. And so it was just such a thing. And so I was really excited to get Mm -hmm. to college and have that behind me. And it wasn't until this kind of chance encounter when I was working at a bike touring company after graduation, and I met this guy who's on the Paralympic Advisory Committee who ultimately connected me with my team. And he was the one who planted the seed that I belonged in the Paralympic world, because I was telling him about my injury and how I'd modified my bike and all of these things. And he just it seemed so plain and simple to him that I should be involved in, in the Paralympic world at some, some capacity. So it was, it's been a long kind of road of, of figuring out my identity as to where I I lie because in, in the day to day, I think I I look like an able-bodied person until you go to shake my hand. I think that has been the, the most obvious sign to people is like my right hand doesn't really work and so if I go to shake your hand I have to shake it lefty and Mm. okay people definitely give me strange looks and I have different kind of elevator pitches depending on the situation how much detail I want to provide so yeah it's been an interesting way to kind of figure out who I am and how to present myself to the world and yeah being also being very grateful for what I have well, wow, I'm I'm proud of you. Yeah, Stephanie, just I listening know, to your story. I know. You're so strong. Thank you. You're so, so strong. strong. I wanted to to dig in a little bit to all, you know, this whole incredible story that you have, how resilient you are, 
But how was it growing up as a redhead in Maine and, yeah. you know, sticking out even more? Like I'm thinking of you going through all these hard times. You're like you have it's not like you're going to stick out no matter what. You have vibrant red hair. It's curly. It's beautiful. <laughs> so how was that? Yeah, I mean, I think the curls were actually more of a challenge than the red hair. Oddly enough, we grew up quite literally next door to a family of four kids and three out of their four had red hair. So oh my God. The world was like a little <laughs> pack. Um, yeah. I actually just saw them this weekend, so we're still close. And it was, it didn't feel that strange because like my- We all had each other yeah. and there were multiple redheads that you were yes. hanging out with every day. And like we have some adorable pictures of like as little kids, just this little pack of redheads. Um, so it was more the curls because nobody in my family has curly hair. And especially when I had the spinal cord injury, I was in a hospital bed and my dad was caring for me quite a bit and had no idea what to do. And so I think that same picture you read the caption off of, that was him taking a brush to my like ringlet curls and just exploding them with frizz. And like, so that was definitely um, a harder thing to grow up with and just kind of figure out. And I felt like every time I went to get a haircut, somebody recommended a different product and it had varying it results, whether or not it made my curls really crunchy or didn't work at all. So yeah, I think that's more, that was more of the, I don't want to say traumatizing point of growing up with his hair, but like the, the stick, the sticking point. Yeah. And figuring out like well, what works for your hair, especially when it's, there's curls, but I think yeah. everyone can agree Oh yeah, that you have to find out which products work for you. And for some, you know, right away, but for others like Adrian and I, it's a journey to find yes. out, oh my gosh, this product or this technique or how I wash my hair, for example, or style yeah. it. Frequency, this, the, all of it. Yeah. And like you can't just no. brush it either. That's so know. funny. No, <laughs> especially the humidity. Adrian and I are originally from Rhode Island. So oh, yes, we understand you know. that New England humidity in the summertime. So you mix yeah. that with, you know, it's a mess. We it have mess. we have pictures of Adrian and I as kids and we were just. I mean, yeah. My mom, our, our mom would try to brush it out too. And we'd go to school and I look at these photos and I'm like, why would yes, you send us to school like that? Like I look like my hair is out to here. And then my mom just thought cutting it was going to be like the thing. And it, so the shorter it was, yes, the wider totally. it went. I had a bob era. <laughs> it was such a regret. Same. Oh, uh, I had a horrible experience. I went for just a trim. Oh and gosh. it was at like an education school in Rhode Island. That... This is one of my favorite stories. And I told my best friend, oh, I'm just going to go for to cut like a few inches off. The next day, literally, she cut it like above my ears. Yes. And I have just... a picture. Yeah. And my my friend that I'm talking about, she's still my best friend. And we have a picture of us in our school, like outside play. And I have my arm around her and I try to hide it. Like the, the new length by putting a headband on that day and now it's a running joke as we're older she'll she'll text me every now and then when she's getting a going to get a haircut she's like I'm only gonna get a few inches it's like a, a running joke but I look at that picture and I'm like I can't believe my hair was like long and this hairstylist like literally cut it above my ears it was but I only Terrible. see that story because it's something that you know I'll never forget same you know, we all have stories that we'll just never forget from our childhood. There are photos that are just burned in your mind. Like, why? Yeah, does... photos. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And you're just like, what was I thinking? Yes, totally. <laughs> I know. Um, so we want to go into the paracycling. So some of our listeners are athletes, but those of who are not, we'd like to go over some terms. So we're just on the same page. Totally. Um, what is paracycling? Well, I guess let's go through each one so that I'm not listing them all um what is paracycling paracycling so think of cycling as a sport there are actually a lot of disciplines within cycling but okay. um the two that para has are track and road cycling so road cycling is probably the one that comes to mind the most when people think of bikes it's like tour de france people yep mass starting um we have two dis or two events we have a road race, which is the mass start one day event. And it's just first to the finish line wins. And then we have a time trial, which is 
an individual event where the rider cannot draft off of anybody else. You're on a rolling start uh, on a designated course, and it's whoever can can have the fastest oh. time. So you have a lot more. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Aerodynamics are come into play quite a bit. You also have just kind of like raw strength for the riders because oftentimes in the road race, it's not necessarily the strongest rider who wins. It's the one who kind of saved saved the energy the most and was the most strategic. So time trialing is a little bit more strength. Um, so that's road. And then on the track, there is what's called a velodrome. This is something that I didn't even know existed until I got into paracycling five, six years ago now. Um, so it's a, a 250 meter track, typically indoors. Sometimes they're outdoors and, uh, it is banked like almost 40 degrees so that you can go at higher speeds and stay upright. And wow. within track cycling, um, there are several, well, there are a lot of events. There are sprint events, endurance events, kind of like running track and field there. Yeah. Um, we have two in the Paralympic Games. We have, well, sorry, we have more than two, but I compete on two. Um, we have a time trial sprint event, so 500 meters, that's two laps. It's very fast, 35 seconds to 40 seconds. And then we have oh, wow. an individual that's pursuit, fun. which is for my my category, three kilometers, so 12 laps. And it's cool. You start on the opposite side of the track as your competitor and you chase each other. So whoever oh. is making up ground and ends up finishing first wins, but you are, are one up against each other. So um, the para side indicates that the athletes have um, physical impairments. And so okay. with para, they um, categorize you based on the extent to which you're impaired. So they try to create level playing fields based on how impaired people are. Um, so that, that's kind of the overview. I mean, there, of course, I can get into the more specifics, but I don't know that it's really relevant. Um, I compete in a category with people who have nerve injuries like I do and have all of their limbs mm. present. They just don't necessarily all work. Um, there are women in my field who have like below the knee amputation plus something else. So we're kind of um, in the the middle of the impairment group. So they're half of the fields are more able than us and half of the fields are more impaired than us. Okay. And then is it is so then the Paralympics, is that every four years or, or is that every two years? Because and then do you do events to qualify for the Paralympics? Kind of like I'm, I'm thinking so. with as the Olympics, does it? follow the same okay yep so we are we compete on the same um schedule as the olympic side so the olympics will take place first and then the paralympics follow immediately after we use the same venues and we have some different sports we also have some overlap and yeah we have the same kind of structure of qualification might not be the exact same selection procedures but you, you have to earn your spot as both mm-hmm. a, as countries. So in order to like take athletes to the Paralympic Games, countries have to uh, acquire results leading in. So the whole like three years leading into the Paralympic and Olympic year um, are very important to do well so that you can take the most athletes. And then as yeah. individual athletes, mm-hmm. you have to earn the spot. So yes, it's very wow. similar. It's... Um, we're just and is paracycling up. the summer Olympic Paralympics, yes. and then you yeah. mentioned skiing. Do you still? Yes, I and s- is that part of winter? So are you doing both? I do not compete in skiing. That's just okay. a fun outlet, but that is cool. in the winter side. So yeah, we're gearing up right now for Paris, which will be this summer. Uh, yeah, so wow. TBD if I make the team or not, but that is- when do you find out? I, the team will be named in July, so we'll oh, race wow. mid-August. So it's a quite a, a tight turnaround. I mean, athletes kind of have a sense of where they stand. Uh, okay, but the team won't officially be named until July. So until July, okay. Here's wow, that is a quick turnaround. You find out July, and then it's yeah. in August. Yeah. Like, wow. Yeah. You are you mentally ready if you're going to do it? Yes, yes, I did have. Yeah, I went. I I competed in Tokyo and didn't have 
the best experience as an individual. I, I definitely had some, some tough events. Um, so I'm hoping for some redemption. So I'm feeling very hyped up mentally to, to oh, have, a, have a better go at the games. Yeah, I know. I wish it was wow. closer or else. Um, my husband and I would be cheering you on with our kids. We'd be in the stands, Aww. but maybe, yeah. maybe Adrian will maybe. go to Paris. Well, <laughs> I've always wanted to go. I, I've, I've been to Paris, but I've always wanted to go to any kind of like any kind of event of ath- athletes just blow me yeah. away. I think that's why Clara, I'm just so interested in talking to you because I'm not even really into sports, but I'm into just like I'm just I just love when all the greats are coming together yeah, the performance side. to yeah oh, the performance it's just it, a, it, it blows mm-hmm. my mind probably because I could never yeah. do it so I'm just like blown away that people dedicate their lives to this yeah, the hard work they're that so goes good into it. yeah yeah and all the hard work and just the reward that people get from it even if they don't right. win it's just the whole process I just like I'm cheering people on then you have like the stories that they show on really? tv I get so connected I'm like oh I just love oh. the whole thing well, LA 2028 is the next game. So maybe. Yeah, that's right. We'll we it. will be there. Yes. Yeah. I don't so, know if I'll be competing, but. <laughs> What's one of your favorite places that you've traveled for your the cycling events? For cycling, for racing, I think my favorite place we've been has been Italy. It's, I mean, amazing yeah. food. We raced like in the foothills of the Dolomites. It was so oh, I pretty. That was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my husband's a skier and he's been just dying yeah. to get there to ski. I, I yeah. would as well. I would be happy to go on skis, but that would be, that's been my favorite trip so far. And then what's it like wow. being a part of Team USA? Yeah, it is. Um, it like was a dream come true. My very first team I made was in 2019. And I mean, as a gymnast, that is the pinnacle of sport, the Olympics. And so Mm -hmm. I remember as a kid, like idolizing all of the Olympians and being obsessed with Team USA and was just wanting to do that so badly for myself. And so it was this amazing feeling to kind of have accomplished that dream in a different avenue, but it still meant the same to me, um, if not more, just because of how much had to overcome to get to that point and yeah. it has not worn off like every time I compete you know wearing the star and stars and stripes it's it's this amazing honor and I just yeah. want to make myself proud but also make all of these people who have just cheered me on from the, my injury to now proud because they've just done a lot to support me I was going to ask you how it is to put, is it called the uniform, like the USA uniform on, you know, you see that, you know, I know you say you're starting is in stripes, but I always see people, you know, when they're doing like the opening ceremonies yeah. wearing, you know, similar things. And I'm like, oh, I wonder how it is to that put that on. Yeah, it's, it's surreal. I mean, it, like Team USA gets the swag down. Like we... I, I I will say like in Tokyo, there were, it was so fun to see what nations provide for their athletes as, as kind of kit for, for their whole time, whether it's casual apparel or race apparel or competition. Um, and we had some flops. I'll say that. I don't want to diss any of our sponsors, but we had a few like just legendary in a funny sense items that we received and people <laughs> made fun of us for them. But, um, yeah, the opening ceremonies outfit is just classic. The one that we had for Tokyo, we had like a blazer with really nice jeans. And um, I recently wore the blazer for a speaking engagement and was just, it still feels like, wow. you know, you're about to go walk in. I mean, Tokyo didn't have a stadium full of people, but uh, just because of COVID, but it's still, you just get this sense of, I don't know, this big event that the whole world is watching. It's yeah. And that you earned, right. you earned your spot. Yeah, really That's cool. what's so cool mm-hmm. is that everyone who's there has earned the right. spot to be there yeah. and how much it put, like had to get poured in to, to make that. And some say like making the games is harder than actually competing there just because of how stress wow. goes into selection. And yeah. And I was wondering too, like, do you, have you made relationships and friends with people who you also compete you with? You wouldn't have known, you know, that are also on Team USA. I mean, there must be some camaraderie, yeah. if that's the word, you know, because you, 
you you can really relate on so many levels. Totally. We're going through a lot of the same things and have the same like inner team politics. But I'll also say like a lot of my closest friends are competitors from other nations. Like I really have grown tight with I was just DMing with a girl from Sweden that um, I compete with and we were talking about the upcoming World Cups trips and it's just really cool to have friends wow. all over the world and have this respect for your competitors and obviously like when we're in a race together I want to beat her but I still can be respect each other yeah and, and your like, friends yeah yeah we we're definitely tight so we're gonna go on a coffee ride when we get there and it'll be nice to catch up, so yeah that's so nice that's so nice. So you share your wins as well as your disappointments on social media, which we mm-hmm. love because sometimes, let's admit it, social everyone, media can be really yeah, yeah, and everyone likes to share like their great days and not the bad days. So then it paints a picture that, oh my God, my life is perfect. But right. exactly. Yeah, yeah Adrian, you were saying, yeah, it's nice that you share Yeah. Both. So which wins are you most proud of so far? I think I have a very obvious literal win, which... Um, was my first world cha- or title. I won the time trial. So the individual event that I had described earlier, where it's just you against the clock in 2022. And that had just been my goal for the season. I really wanted to um, wear the stripes, which in cycling, I guess the analogy. So like in the Tour de France, the the leader wears the yellow jersey. That's kind of the famous jersey so for world champions throughout the entire next season they get to wear a white jersey with the rainbow stripes on them designating that they are the world champion currently and so every time I started a time trial so the same discipline that I had won in um, the next season I would be racing in stripes and so it just comes with this huge honor that uh, yeah. you yeah. made wow. this big accomplishment and then uh, you get to, it kind of lasts for a whole season to come. And so that was amazing just to feel like, and we had just talked about performance. Like I so often have results where I felt like, you know, I did the, the best I could on the day, but everything didn't come together. So like I fell off in some capacity or like my, I had some mechanical issue with my bike or whatever it may be where I felt like I didn't necessarily get the most out of what I had been doing to prepare. And that race in 2022, I felt like everything clicked. Like it was this amazing training block leading up where I felt great physically. Like my injuries were at bay. I was just getting amazing volume and intensity and all the things. And then I traveled very well where I like showed up feeling pretty fresh. And then my bike was perfect. And I just rode the course the best I could. And it just felt like this wonderful, like payoff where I not only wow. had this dream performance, which I think is probably the only one that I've ever had in my career, but then I also had the results to back it up where like I did, I did end up winning. And so That was amazing. Um, But then I will say the other kind of big win for me was in Tokyo. I, like I had said, didn't have the best um, showing there. I had had kind of an injury just prior to travel. And it was really hard on me because I had this amazing season before. And I was feeling all this pressure, both from my team and individually. And I to the point where I like, I didn't even want to start. I felt so unlike myself and unlike the best I was expecting of myself. And I ended up doing the races, even though I felt like they were not at all what I wanted to be doing at the time. And I remember finishing the road race and just being really proud that I had the, the courage to line up. And I had the option to not race, even though I was injured and I just was really glad that I I was there for the experience and um, gave it everything I had, but didn't necessarily have the results. So I think that was a massive win too, just to mentally be there. Just to do it, just to to give it your best shot. So, yeah, yeah. Sometimes just, uh, we were talking to a fitness person 
on the podcast recently and I thought she, her advice was great. Like for someone who's just getting into exercising, let's just say Clara, they're like opposite of you. Right. And they go, she said, sometimes she just recommends just walking into totally. the gym. Just sometimes like the little wins, like mm -hmm. even if you don't work out, just getting into the routine right. of it. And I was like, oh, that's kind of awesome to not be like, okay, we well, have to start working out 45 minutes starting tomorrow. Right. Like, and sometimes even when you're so professional, like you are just doing the race yeah. and is an accomplishment in itself. Totally. And like there, everybody has a, such a big backstory of how they get to the star line. And so that's what makes you appreciate the good performances even more is like how much has to click mm. in order for you to have a good performance. And so, yeah, it just it makes you really respect the sport and the competitors. And yeah, I was on that day proud to, to make it to the start line. Redheads, have you heard? We aired on ABC Shark Tank, episode 14, season 15. We are busy developing products and continuing to grow this incredible redhead lifestyle brand. Check out our mascara and eyebrow products and red hot shades, hair care, merch, lifestyle items, and so much more. Redheads, we can now rejoice. Finally, there are products for us. Use code podcast to get 15% off your next purchase. Shop at shop.howtobearedhead.com. Yeah. So speaking of that, so how do you pick yourself up after a disappointment? Like the time that you got a stomach virus right before oh, a big gosh. race, how do you persevere? Um, I think it's a combination of like the zoom out and just realize like how many performances have gone well. And, um, also leaning on the support system for me, I, I'm fortunate to have my family travels to most of my events. And so it's nice to just get a hug and feel like, okay, no matter what, they're still going to love me. Um, yeah. Mm. And I actually got some really awesome advice from my um, national team coach in Tokyo. She was also a competitor herself before she retired and took on this role. And she told me to think about what my dog would, would say, which is kind oh, of like, I love that. To say, which she's like, They'd say you're perfect in every like, way. Yeah, yeah, I love you. <laughs> just come home. Um, and so she's always like, from then on, from that piece of advice, now she'll just say like, what would Kaya think? <laughs> just Aww. She doesn't care about the medal. She'll still love you. And I think that sentiment has kind of carried. It's like people don't necessarily attach results to my worth. You know, I think like the real ones in my life will love me no matter how I perform. And oftentimes or I know always I'm the one who puts the most pressure on myself. So it's a, just a combination of, yeah. of perspective. And I also started working with a sports psych right after Tokyo and really felt like that's made a huge impact just to come up with some strategies to keep the race day anxiety at bay. And then also again, to like reframe if things don't go well and um, also how to kind of stay mentally fresh throughout the, the training too, because that can be really draining with, just how yeah. Time. I was thinking about how a lot of things must be mental yes. for mm. athletes at your level that really? I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, um, was, I just talked about it briefly yesterday, but our dad has been going through some issues with, and so we've been learning a lot about the brain and in some ways I'm just like, oh wow. Like so many things are mental. Like for instance, he'll work out an hour or two hours mm. because he's not like realizing that he has you know, that he has like something going on mm -hmm. in the brain, but he's so positive and like upbeat and full of energy. And I'm just like, maybe it yeah. is all mental because you never wanted to work out this long, yeah. you know? So I'm, that's why I'm like, oh, wow. I feel like sometimes I wonder with athletes, like if it's, you have to get more mentally because obviously you're physically ready, right? You guys have been, you guys work out all the time, but it must be so crazy just mentally to get ready. Yeah, I definitely especially like as events grow in in um weight to whether that's selection for a team or more viewers or more money on the line whatever it may be like the pressure builds and that's when that's really hard to kind of stay on your mental game cuz you can just crumble with with the just impending doom feeling and so i think that's been a huge help to work with somebody who's specialty is getting athletes mentally at their best so yeah okay so Clara you have very curly hair like we talked about so tell us about the products you use and what your routine looks like or what you do every day 
Wow. It's a grab bag. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way of saying it. Yeah. Same here. I feel like I kind of have a, a big rotation of products that I'm always kind of adding to and just trying to to get the same effectiveness as when I find a product, love it, and I use it for a bit, and then it's somehow like... Stops the, working. Yeah, it just doesn't, it doesn't have the same effectiveness. So I've overtaken like my boyfriend's side of the shower and just like adding all of my products. It's kind of a running joke that he has one and I have like, you know, 20 <laughs> yeah. plus, I don't know. Um, I know, I know. It's all, yeah. And I can totally understand when you try a product, you really love it on your hair. And then a few weeks later, or a couple months, whenever, it just kind of stops doing its thing that it initially yeah. did. Don't know why that happens. But I, too, experience yeah. that. But then I keep the product because I'm like, really? okay, maybe it will, yeah, you know, but... I don't want to just throw it out. I just bought it. But right. maybe it will start working again. So then I may put it in the back and then I may take it for, try it after a little bit. But, yeah, like my husband's saying to me sometimes, like, you have so many products. But I'm like, everyone serves a purpose and yes. comes into my life at different points when <laughs> – I need it the most. Um, yeah. But yeah, I could totally, totally relate. And it's finding yeah. – and then curls, for instance, like, I don't know. It depends on the time of year, the weather. Oh, like, do you experience when you're training? Like, do – how – with yes. sweating and stuff, does that affect totally. your curls? Yeah. So, yeah, I think there is – the weather and the time of year, the humidity, all that mm. impacts my curls. Um, I never brush them. I just kind of run my fingers through it in the shower and like get the dreads out basically. Because <laughs> even a day, it just gets so matted up. Um, and I always ride with like a really tight bun, like a low bun underneath. My I was going to ask if you if you pulled it back all the time. Yeah. yeah. And it... It just, it gets so sweaty, like underneath my helmet, because I'll ride for like five or six hours at the longest, but most days two or three at the minimum. And so it just like is sitting underneath this helmet. So I feel like I have to wash my hair more often than I want to, just because it's more so my scalp. Um, mm -hmm. So I wash my hair like a few times a week, which before I was into competitive cycling, I would wash it like every two weeks or so because my curls would just look so much more like tighter and less frizzy. But at this point, that's like the comfort and the hygiene, hygiene rather than yeah. the, the aesthetics. Like I have yeah. to take the L while I'm in this life. Um, <laughs> and, and then how about makeup? Um we know that we sent you some. So did you yes. have a chance to try them? I am wearing the chestnut. The finally have left. Oh, oh, me too. You are? I am yes. too. I mm -hmm. love it. It's so hard. to. I mean, like truly, this product is amazing in that like I, I look so bad in like bright black. I like mascara. Like my eyes are translucent or my eyelashes. I um, Same. Eyebrows can't see them yes, they don't <laughs> exist i mean like in this lighting especially i don't have eyebrows i have not tried the um the brow products yet i truly i just got home last night from my trip so um just life well if you have any questions you know you can reach out to us directly we're happy to to help because our brows too like i cannot see them right. stephanie has a little bit more pigment than me yeah. but like if i don't wear luckily i don't know if it's luckily but i have like thick eyebrow hair so it kind of like just layers on top of blonde, 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 yeah. blonde. <laughs> so then I, I'm like, oh, when I don't get my eyebrows done, you can kind of see them. But then when I get them done, I'm like, they're really just non-existent. Right. Yeah. So I actually have been wearing blue mascara quite a bit. Oh, um, love that. That's cool. Yeah, like that. It like is so prominent on my eyes. My eyes are blue. And I had a guy How pretty. who worked. I lived at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, and there was a woman who worked there who was blonde, and she also had very light lashes. And that was her daily. So I started as wearing it for just race days. Like, it was just like the mental cue. Like, it's race day. I'm going to wear my, my waterproof blue mascara. And then... I started to wear it on the daily and I actually kind of like it. So I'm, I'm excited to have wow. some like 
it feels kind of not unprofessional, but just people people look at you strange at first. So I'm like, okay, I think I maybe need to tone it down and just just rock what truly would be my color. So the chestnut has been a great. Oh, oh that's, that's so, so happy. cool. We have we have perfectly plum coming out soon, yes, which I is like a that. deeper purple. So yeah, we'll send it to you. Oh, I would love it. So okay, is it like? I know the the listeners can't see, but is it like the wall color behind me? Like like very plum. Yeah, it's like a deep, it's a deep purple. Pretty. It's really oh, pretty. Yeah. It's really pretty. I want to say it's like the purple version of chestnut. Like it's not like pretty. it's like a it's not like that deep. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's really beautiful. Okay. Yeah, we worked really hard on it. And I think it's gonna it yeah, it's just something about the color yeah. that's really beautiful. I think that it doesn't look black and it doesn't look brown. And it also, yeah, there's And it's not like a bright, gonna bright purple. Up. It's like more of like yeah. the... Like Stephanie's top. <laughs> I tried that. I tried like a bright purple and it looked almost red and it was terrifying. Like I yes. immediately threw it out and I don't do that with beauty products very often because I feel bad, but... No, because I... Yeah, because then it, well, it also makes your eyes look like red. Like, yes. yeah. like, out, like, like yeah. the other day my eyes got really from just like allergies and that's what I think of because I've tried products like that and then it looks like I irritated my eyes or my eyes look like something's wrong with them in terms of redness so can totally relate and but yeah the plum is really really beautiful so we'll definitely send you it when it officially releases um and we'd like to kind of um talk about now your life currently and what you have going on. Um, Can you tell us about being a subject for the short film ability? Hmm. Yeah. So this was uh, a project that we filmed in 2021. I had, it it was like a friend of a friend. Like I said, I went to a really small high school, so we didn't know each other um, directly, but she was a classmate of my younger brothers who uh, trained at the same gym I did just, after my accident so we never met and she then went on to become a filmmaker and so she reached out to wow. me on Facebook and just said hey like I know of you and I would love to to do a film on your story it's um pretty cool and so wow she and her um filmmaker friend Jordan so this was Anna had reached out Anna Burns and her um friend Jordan Romero made a, a, a lady squad which I really loved um, and they came out to Montana where I was living at the time and we filmed, I mean, we just got so lucky with the weather. We had this gorgeous weekend in May and it was pretty quiet. Like the national park visitors weren't really in full, full swing yet in Glacier where I was living and just had these epic shots at sunset, like among the mountains. And it was, wow. it was cool. Wow. And, um, my mom did a lot of work to dig up the archive, d- dig through the, the footage that we had. Um, and so that really made it come together. And wow. yeah, they went, they premiered at the main outdoor film festival and went to a few other film festivals. And I, I mean, it's an honor to like have, have somebody want to make a film on my story. And then yeah. like, they just did such a great job. I was really, really flattered. Wow. That's, that is such an honor. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about this, but because Stephanie and I are also close siblings, we know that you're really close with your siblings. Tell us about the tattoo that you got with them. You know, Stephanie and I back in the day wanted to get matching tattoos and we never did. You have it? Yeah. No. Well, I, I definitely got peer pressured into it. My other, so I'm one of four, I would say it's, 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 uh, no secret that three out of the four of us are very, very close. And, um, so Spencer and Rachel are my, my other two that I'm tightest with and they wanted one and really pressured me into it. Cause I was like, Oh, I just don't know if I'll ever get a tattoo. I wasn't sure about it. And then, um, we settled. I mean, I finally got convinced of course, cause <laughs> I'm pretty, I'm pretty easy to, to, yeah. to convince, but, um, we settled on the outline of the lake we grew up um on which again very very cool. lucky to have grown up wow. in a, on a lake in Maine so it's yeah uh just just the outline of the lake and then we put a dot where our house is so it is oh, that's so special that's so nice yeah, so, I, so you can reflect back on your childhood yeah. almost instantly 
Yeah, so I got mine like on my tricep. My brother has his on like the inside of his bicep. My sister has hers on her wrist. So they're all in different places. But yeah, I think that's going to be my one and only. I felt like if I was going to get a tattoo with somebody, they were one of the more sure bets. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I loving them, so... <laughs> Oh, that's so nice. Yes. Um, and I couldn't believe this, I but Clara, know. now that we've been talking, I, I, I can, can believe, believe it, it right? <laughs> yeah. um, you've said that cycling feels like flying, but you actually have real ambitions to fly. Yes. So tell us about training to get your pilot's that license. That is so cool. That's crazy. Yes. I can't believe people who want to fly. Just, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, so I grew up my dad is a pilot he um that's all oh I, okay I so there's kind of okay the so, yeah okay so it's kind of in your blood too yeah so he has flown ever since i was a kid he flew in the navy and then now he flies commercially and my parents got divorced when i was in high school and my dad um pretty soon after started dating a woman uh who he flies with and she's a oh. pilot and she's actually a redhead so um, that's so cool yeah <laughs> wow i mean again i like knew growing up like it was a cool job and i don't know where i would have landed but amanda definitely was like a catalyst in that i just didn't know mm. any other women pilots like it was it's still i think to this day one of the the most uh male dominated male dominated. yeah it's fewer yeah. than 10 percent women still which is wild um and so just kind of hearing her story and after I got hurt, I knew military was off the table. Not that that was something I was really considering, but given my disability, I, I could not get flight training through the military like my dad did. And I really just didn't have any idea how to go about it as a civilian. And so after talking to Amanda quite a bit and hearing her story, and she actually had switched careers. So she was working in an entirely different field until she was in her early 30s and then decided she wanted to go fly planes. So she went and put herself through flight school while she was still working and um, did did the thing. So wow. yeah, I kind of had this realization a few years ago that this is really what I wanted to do. Um, and again, with the medical side of things, I was just concerned that I would be too impaired to fly. And my younger brother had started this process and he actually just got hired by his first job so maybe he'll be flying us around soon um wow and a friend of a friend so one of his students friends uh is a an amputee and a pilot and my brother kind of his ears perked up and was like oh can i get his contact info i'd love to connect him with my sister and we uh, had a lot of conversations back and forth about i mean he's amputated at his shoulder so he flies entirely one-armed and um he was just the most encouraging guy and he just kept saying like if I can do this you can do this because you have a lot more function than I do and he would send me videos as to how he's flying and um yeah he really inspired me so the combination of like is in the family but then um he was kind of the one inspiration yeah inspired me so I started school last fall and it's been in Maine we're very uh unfortunate with the weather like we just can't fly a lot of the winter time just because of the the freezing weather and the clouds and all that so it took quite a bit of time off this this winter and I'll start up again and yeah hopefully I'll be a commercial pilot someday It'll be wow, you, you are wow. so remarkable. <laughs> I hope <laughs> I know. I can't believe it. You know, I was flying from Santiago, Chile to um, back to America a couple years ago. And I re- it was the first time on an international flight that I had a woman pilot and she came on and no one really like thought anything. I didn't see anyone like say anything, but she was like, hi, I'm, you know, and like once you get on a plane to another country, like we're, like you're already like on that you're already in the country almost. Yeah. So when we got on the plane from Chile, I knew that we were like already in America because then like everyone's like English speaking right. and the pilots are American and all of that. And um, I, I remember she she was talking to like be on a plane with a woman it's pilot. So rare going, to, international. It's so yes. rare, yeah. rare to hear them when they do oh, talk right. about. It took whatever. me back. Like I almost, she was like, hi, I'm pilot, whatever right. her name was. 
and I took my headphones off to listen yes. because I was so expecting a guy to come over the yeah. the intercom and be like, "I'm officer." <laughs> I mean, the I've had only one full female crew in my life, um, and it's just special. It feels, yeah, it is. I mean, like shouldn't matter, but it really it just is inspiring. And yeah, it is. It is. It is. Yeah, other people doing it really allows more to 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 get after it right it almost paves the way like when you hear exactly. one female pilot and then you may have always maybe entertained the idea of being a pilot mm -hmm. and you're a woman for example and you're like wow i can do that like yeah. it's not just a male hopefully yeah. maybe hopefully it will change later um where it could be 50 50 or maybe women one day will dominate you know that's that yeah. would be so cool that would be yeah, it's just that would be like, awesome everything in in the aviation world is like always referring to other pilots as men or guys mm. like you know oh i bet that's him up there or you know you're just you never yeah. see that it's a woman or like yeah all the language is like air men air, air, whatever like and so it's yeah. just i hope one day there there are more women and it's not the default to refer to another pilot as a to him, or him. A guy or, yeah you know that like it is potentially possible that and it is know. normal to have yeah. like adrian experienced a female pilot yeah. yeah yeah that is so cool so clara any last words for anyone going through a hard time overcoming it and wanting to conquer life because like you, you are the epitome yeah. of like doing that <laughs> you the are example yeah um thanks that's so kind i think what has really gotten me through is just like the the sense of like how how much how how grateful you should be for what you have already and mm -hmm. um feeling lucky with what i what i've got and wanting to to maximize that like wanting to make the most of of what i've been given and um and i think also just appreciating how fun life is like to enjoy what you're doing no matter what and um setting small goals for yourself that are attainable and not feeling overwhelmed by this looming daunting thing just break it down into smaller smaller uh slices and it feels a little bit more attainable yeah smaller yeah goals. like one step at a time yes. one day at a yeah, time one day at a time yeah well, we'll we're going to continue to cheer you on, cheer you on, Clara, and um, we are so proud of you. So just keep doing it, and I hope one day we're flying and you you're the pilot. That would be a dream come true, like truly. What if we just did a, a full redhead plane? Yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> we'll bring a sign. We'll bring a sign. We're so proud of you. <laughs> I would love that. Thank you so much. Thank you.